here at Google London. Um, this book is about 10 years of my life, trying to figure out why people are good and evil. That's the longest debate since humans have been having debates, right? Are we good? Are we evil? And of course the answer is we're both, but that doesn't really help us. The question is why, right? Why would I ever behave in a way that's compassionate or kind, or why would I behave in a way that's cruel and aggressive? Um, so let me start out by telling you a little uh, about two women. Um, one of whom you may have heard of, one of whom you didn't. Uh, the first picture is from a crime scene. Uh, this crime was perpetrated by a woman that I interviewed in the San Diego County Jail in California. So you have to picture her, she's wearing an orange jumpsuit, her hands are shackled in front of her to her legs, and she was a 25-year-old longtime meth user, so it tells you when she started using meth, and she had served a prison term for uh, possession of methamphetamine, and then was sent to a halfway house, so kind of transitioned her back into life. And this halfway house were uh, four women living together, so three women and her, and they had a shared kitchen and living space. And she and this other women kept on having these clashes. So one day in the kitchen, the prisoner I'm talking to decides to stab her roommate 22 times and let her bleed to death on the kitchen floor. So going through this long interview, you know, when did you first start using drugs, maybe your family history, my family, and she's already pled to murder, so she's agreed that she killed the lady. And I said, so why did you kill this woman? Ah, she bugged me, right? As if she's a fly, as she's swatting on the wall. Okay, case two, this is a picture from the 1930s. Again, a woman who's about 25 years old at the time. And her name is Agnes Bishoyi, and she's Albanian. She's from a fairly wealthy family. At age 18, she decides she's gonna leave home and join a convent called the Sisters of Loreto. It's going to be very important. There's a quiz at the end of this talk, so remember Sisters of Loreto because it's going to be a key part of my story. So she goes to England for training, she goes to Ireland, and she's posted to India, where she spends her entire career ministering to the poor, the sick, the untouchables, that is Mother Teresa. She never returned home again, never saw her family, never saw her siblings. Right? She dedicated her whole life to helping other people. So how do we get both those behaviors within the human species? Killing people like they're nothing and reaching out. So flip that around, think of your own lives. Right, you all look like pretty nice people. A couple of the guys in the back I'm not so sure about, but the rest of you look pretty good. So how can you yourself go from being nice, relaxed, kind, smiling to mean, aggressive, grumpy, nasty? Right? How, do, how does that switch occur? And so scientists have studied for a long time the nasty part, the aggression, the fear, because that gets huge responses in the brain. But I want to ask the other question. What modulates us to be more like Mother Teresa, more compassionate, more kind, to reach out to others? And this took me on a 10-year journey, and I'll tell you a little about that. But before I do, I want to give you an idea of some of the fun experiments that we've run, not just in the laboratory, but in the field. So this one happened right here in England. And... Um, I have a short video. Most people plan to make their wedding special, but this wedding in southern England was a first for science. Nick and Linda invited researcher Paul Zak to take blood samples from them and their guests. It was a chance to find out what goes on in people's bodies during this momentous bonding event. The value of doing this as a field study is that we have an actual real life event. So this way we actually go in, in a very natural setting, a wedding with 100 people, some of which knew each other and some of which didn't know each other. Thirteen people, including the bride and groom, had their blood drawn before and after the couple took their vows. Zach wanted to find out if there would be a rise in their oxytocin, a hormone associated with love, trust and bonding. We thought maybe during this wedding ceremony people are bonding to each other and they're actually releasing oxytocin. So we measured oxytocin, and we also measured a bunch of other hormones that were also associated with reproduction. Zach found that the couple and close family members had more extreme <coughs> changes in oxytocin. Linda had the biggest spike in oxytocin, 28% increase in oxytocin before and after her vows. So she's really feeling the love. Who's next? The bride's mother. Of course the bride's mother is very engaged emotionally. And then the groom's father. And then the groom. And then further out, are some just random friends that we pulled. Testosterone is linked to sex drive, and studies have found that it drops when men fall in love. Zach expected this to happen at the wedding too, but results proved otherwise. 
we also found that testosterone levels were flat for all the men who we tested, except for the groom. So immediately after the vows, his testosterone levels doubled from beforehand. Why is that? He had this beautiful woman wearing a gorgeous strapless gown, and he's thinking about the honeymoon. According to Zach, the most important finding was that just being part of a wedding makes us release oxytocin. This may help explain why most people choose to have a wedding instead of eloping with their partner. I think the ritual evolved because we all have a stake in sustaining the human race. Bride and groom have a built-in set of people who are emotionally engaged with them, who care about the outcome. Okay, so that was one of the fun experiments we've done outside the lab, but it's just a way to demonstrate that the kind of behaviors we're finding in the lab that induce the release of oxytocin, which I call the moral molecule, happen in our daily lives all the time. And I think that's why this work is very interesting, is because our brains are living in this sea of chemicals, and we're not always aware of the chemicals that are being released and how they impact our behavior. Um, so oxytocin, until we started doing these experiments 10 years ago, was only known in human beings to fac facilitate birth and breastfeeding. Uh, in fact, one of my colleagues, when I thought, well, maybe oxytocin might modulate positive behaviors in humans, told me it was the world's stupidest idea. He said, everybody knows it's just for birth, and it's not very important. So, but men's brains release this too, I said, you know, and there must be a reason why. Um, and in animals, oxytocin had been shown to facilitate tolerance for animals that live together. So I thought, well, tolerance to, like, treating people well, that kind of runs on a continuum. Maybe this works in humans. Okay, great idea. Difficult execution. So oxytocin is a very shy little molecule. You have to coax it out of the brain. It has a three-minute half-life and then it disappears. And so it required some very tight experimental procedures to get this thing to be released. And again, before we started doing this, the only ways known were birth, breastfeeding, and also sex, all three of which are too messy to run in my lab. So we thought, well, maybe here's a way we could induce the release of oxytocin in a way that I can do consistently over and over and over and would explain one of the mysteries of life, which is why we actually trust strangers. So we used this task, task that was uh, developed by a guy who won the Nobel Prize in economics for inventing experimental economics, now called the trust game. And here's the task. So everyone gets recruited to be in this experiment. You get $10 if you agree to sit in these hard chairs for an hour and a half. And after lots of instruction and no deception at all, we never deceive people because we're the moral behavior guys. It would be bad karma to deceive people in experiments. Here's the task. You log in the computer. Your identity is masked with a secret number, and you get paid in private when the experiment's over. And you get randomly matched with someone else in the lab who also got $10 for showing up. And here's the task. There's a first decision maker and a second decision maker in each pair. And the first decision maker gets a prompt by computer saying, would you like to give up some of the $10 you've earned for being here and transfer it to the other person in the lab. What if you give up comes out of your account but gets tripled in the other person's account? So if you give up, say, eight of your $10, you keep two, but that person just got 24. So the second person gets the matches saying, guy one sent you $24, you have $34 in your account, would you like to send some amount back to that first person? So you can see if you think about this task, right, the pie's gonna grow by three but if you're the first decision maker, you have to hope, believe, trust that this person isn't going to, in fact, get the signal and return the money. But from the second decision maker's perspective, whatever they return to you comes out of their account one to one. It doesn't get tripled again. It's a pure monetary loss. Oh, I forgot to tell you. We're going to stab your arm with a needle twice and take four tubes of blood each time. So you're literally making decisions based on blood money. And so why would you ever do this? Right? So. What we showed is that the more money you receive as a second decision maker denoting trust, the more your brain releases oxytocin, and the more oxytocin on board, the more you reciprocate. And this is actually really interesting news. We have a biological basis for reciprocation. Essentially, this is the golden rule. The golden rule exists in every culture on the planet. It says, if you play nice, I play nice. For 95% of the people, this is true. The 5% who don't get this are interesting. I'll tell you about those in a minute. Right. So once we discovered that oxytocin facilitated this reciprocal behavior, this, this trusting behavior, um, we had to really dig into this deeper. I mean, this is you know, potentially very valuable. 
So not only do we measure oxytocin in blood, we measure lots of other chemicals that interact with oxytocin. None of those had an effect on this behavior. And we developed an oxytocin nasal inhaler in which I can shoot synthetic oxytocin into the brain safely. We've done this for about 700 people now. And we can turn on these moral behaviors like a garden hose. So not just trust, but things like generosity, where to be generous towards you means I have to lose money myself. Uh, things like um, being compassionate, um, being charitable, giving money to charity. So once we stimulate the brain to release oxytocin or shoot this into your brain synthetically, all of a sudden people are reaching out to others. So one way to think about this is oxytocin evolved in mammals to motivate care for offspring. And in humans, this system works so powerfully because we have these little parasites called children attached to us for so long that we attach to all kinds of people, including strangers. But I think that's one of the great triumphs of the human species is that we can extract value from social relationships. And sometimes that value is romantic partners or friendships, but we can actually interact with strangers and get lots of value out of those relationships, sometimes economic value, right? So how do we all work together, right? So again, if you guys were rats in this room, bro would be flying, right? Rats who don't know each other don't like each other. But again, most people here look pretty comfortable and relaxed. How do we do that? Right, because we have something in our heads, oxytocin, that says, Johnny, perfectly safe, seems to be a great guy, and Michael, kind of sketchy, right? I don't want to be around Michael. So again, if we didn't have that in our heads, we couldn't modulate the appropriate behavior. Right? So for Michael, I want to go in and, and fight with him. So I have different chemicals that tell me, like testosterone, that tells me how to do that. Okay, so that's the basic outline. The open question, though, is what it feels like when your brain releases oxytocin. So we ran an experiment designed by uh, one of my former graduate students, now a faculty member with me, George Barraza, which we had people watch a very sad a video, a 100-second video of a father and his two-year-old son. The son's name is Ben, and he has terminal brain cancer. These are not actors. These are real people, and Ben actually has now died. So I'm not going to show you the video because the last time I showed it was at a law conference, and several lawyers actually cried. And you know, lawyers don't have souls. So you know, I don't want to make you nice people cry. Anyway, it's a very emotional video. There's a control video in which Ben and his father are just at the zoo. And there's no mention of cancer or death. So for the treatment video, when the father actually talks to the camera and talks about how it knows to feel his son's going to die in a couple of months, and the son doesn't know it. He's just a happy little kid going through chemo, whatever. Uh, we get a 47% increase in oxytocin, huge, I mean, just enormous increase. And people are more generous to strangers in the lab with the money they earn for being there. They donate more money to the charity that produced this ad. Um, but they reported feeling the, the experience of empathy. So the change in oxytocin correlated positively with a sense of empathy. So it seems to be empathy that oxytocin makes us feel. So again, when I release oxytocin, I'm more connected to you emotionally. I'm, I'm better able to forecast your emotions and therefore understand what you're likely to do. This is pretty useful when you're around the strangers. So why is that useful? Well, that's consistent with human beings having to modulate our behavior to fit the environment we're in, right? So if I have a sense of empathy, then I can figure out if you're going to be aggressive, if you're going to be dangerous, if you're going to be useful to have a relationship with, right? I'm plugged in more with you than just having a cognitive mechanism that says, here are the 14 things I can do. If you do this, I do that. Now I'm kind of inside your head or inside your heart, if you will. I'm getting a sense of what you're likely to do. OK, so why are people ever good when no, one, when no one's watching? In our experiments, you're in a partition booth. You have a ton of privacy. You can walk out of the lab with the money that people have given you, but most people don't do that. Why not? Well, maybe God's watching you. So you're going to get punished now or later. Maybe the government's watching you. Right? Maybe people have the sense that you know, if I do something bad, eventually I'll get caught and punished. Or maybe this guy in the bottom of the screen was right. So that's a picture of Adam Smith, Scottish philosopher, famous for uh, being the, quote, father of economics, wrote a book in 1776 called The Wealth of Nations, which you guys have all heard of. But it turns out that Smith was, in fact, a moral philosopher. And he wrote a book in 1759 called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. I have to tell you a little about Smith. He was a weird guy. 
He sometimes would get so caught up in his own thinking that he would leave the house in his pajamas. He lived with his mother his entire life until she died. He was a kind of a weird character, and he was a very minor figure. Uh, still a guy in Edinburgh, you know, giving lectures on moral philosophy. But this book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, made him a rock star, right? So 18th century Europe, this guy is the thing. He's having dinner with the King of France. He's hanging out with Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson because he developed, in this book, the first fully terrestrial theory of morality. And that theory said that we are uh, social creatures and we have what he called mutual sympathy. We would call that empathy today. And because we have mutual sympathy, we inhabit other people's heads just a little bit. So if I do something that brings Johnny pain, I'm going to feel that pain. So I tend not to do that because I don't like pain. And if I do something that brings Michael pleasure, I get to share in that pleasure. And therefore, I tend to do those things. And so we worked out the conditions in which this would accentuate or be inhibited. So I had the same discovery. I just found the neuroscience behind it. So Smith seemed to be right. We have this underlying kind of yin and yang of morality right inside us. Half that is oxytocin. It's what, it, what we feel when um, you know, we're in other people's presence, what we're uh, experiencing from them, and we call it empathy. The, the yang part is punishment, which I'll tell you about in a minute, which is interesting. So I think the punchline here is that we don't need God or government telling us what to do because we have this internal monitor that's kind of like rocket thrusters, right? As we live in the sea of strangers, we've got to figure out which direction to go. And the, again, the negative direction was pretty well understood, how to be aggressive, the mechanisms behind that. But the positive rocket thruster was not understood before we started running these experiments. And that's actually a really important part of the puzzle because we do see in many circumstances lots of good behavior among the humans. Okay, so one reason not to uh, motivate more behaviors is this one. This is from so-called Boston. Oxytocin? It's a hormone, not a drug. What does it do? Well, essentially, it causes people to trust you. There's a hormone that causes people to trust you? I mainly used it for me. It can also help people with social anxieties. It enabled me to trust her as well. I'd spray it on like cologne. It has a nice, gentle fragrance, not too bold. Anyway, Dana, that's her name. She found out, and she's suing me. <sighs> You're disappointed in me. Well, I am, Jerry. Truth be told. Okay, so two lessons come from this video. One is be careful what you do in research because the TV shows will pick it up. Right? Um, but the answer here to increase moral behaviors is not to spritz you know, the rooms with oxytocin. So in fact, when we do these experimental tests where we infuse oxytocin, you're getting about two teaspoons of liquid up your nose. You know you're getting it. It's not very pleasant. And that's kind of a sledgehammer. So your brain's own oxytocin system has this very short on-off. It's got a three-minute half-life. Right? So I see Johnny. I turn it on. He's safe. It allows me to approach him. So oxytocin modulates its approach, withdrawal, trust, distrust behavior. I don't want to leave that switch on because, again, it might run into Michael, scary guy, and I don't want to be reaching out to him because he might hurt me right? or I might just not be appropriate person to be around. So I've always got to modulate this kind of behavior. But even with a drug, we don't see oxytocin turning people into gullible you know, piles of mush where they're just you know, giving away money. They're still cognitively intact. They've just changed this balance between self and other. So one way to think about oxytocin is this um, molecule that motivated us to care for our offspring makes us treat strangers like family, right? So that can be a very beautiful thing. All of a sudden, now my family has enlarged, and it could include potentially the entire planet, right? So I can connect to anybody around the planet. So it's not drugs. It's understanding how your brain releases oxytocin that can motivate these positive social behaviors. By the way, I'm using the word moral, and there's, it's, it's not a big M, it's a small M. So moral just means appropriate social behaviors, like the golden rule. I have no theological or, or uh, philosophical stake in some other version of that. So it just means the positive social behaviors that sustain you in the social group as a human being. Okay, so oxytocin actually activates a larger brain circuit, which I call the home circuit. 
OM stands for Human Oxytocin Mediated Empathy, and it utilizes two other neurotransmitters, dopamine and serotonin, and the arrows show the kind of pathways that oxytocin, which is released deep in the brain stem, these evolutionarily old areas of the brain, into uh, areas that modulate social behaviors and social memories. What's important about this is that the brain has set, set it up so that it feels good to do good. So in particular, you get this dopamine release that reinforces positive social behaviors, and you get a mood lift from serotonin release. So the brain is set up to motivate positive behavior. So it's not an anomaly that we treat people well, that we hold doors for people going into office buildings. That's actually part of our deep evolutionary history, again, because that's what sustains us in our social group, is behaving in appropriate ways. Right, again, if I run into a scary guy or someone's threatening my kids, believe me, I'm going to turn it on and take them out if I can, uh, or get my kids away. But for the most part, for most people, most of the time, you play nice, they're going to play nice. Okay, so the most of the time, of course, is where the rubber hits the road. So let's talk about ways we can inhibit oxytocin release. So there's a couple interesting ways. One of those is high levels of stress. So it turns out that moderate stress induces more oxytocin release. Right? In a stressful situation, you can want to bond together. So think of yourself in the, uh, I don't know, in the airplane, in the, in the bed, the bed thunderstorm, the plane's jumping around, and you have avoided talking to your seatmate, right? You're reading your book, you're playing your computer, and now you start talking. You can't read anyway, but you start talking. Man, I hate these thunderstorms. Sucks. I want to get home, right? Why do you do that? It's, it's actually calming to be going through something stressful with someone else. But at high levels of stress, the plane's going down, it's all about you. Right, your brain says, hey, you've got to get through the next 20 minutes. Forget about everybody else. So you guys know that. When you're under high stress, you're not your best self, right? Kind of nasty, you're grumpy, you're short-tempered. And then what do you have to do the next day? You have to go into work or to your spouse and go, man, I was a jerk yesterday. <laughs> I was having a really bad day. My dog died, my car broke down, whatever it is. And then you have to rebuild those social relationships. Okay, the other potent oxytocin inhibitor that we found in the lab is a chemical that is the most important chemical to half the people in this room, testosterone. So when we administer testosterone to men in experiments, compared to themselves on placebo, we can make them more selfish and more entitled. Okay, so who are the most selfish entitled people on the planet? Teenage boys, which half of us used to be, we can tell you that. Right, so um, but we also find that high testosterone individuals, mostly males, but sometimes females, are also more likely to punish people for moral violations. For example, violations of sharing norms. So the yang of biology is punishment. So I might be nice to you because I have this oxytocin release. I don't want to give you pain because I'm going to feel that pain. Or because I fear that you're going to be aggressive towards me. You're going to, you're going to uh, view what I'm doing as bad behavior if I don't play nice and get aggressive towards me, particularly if I'm a male. And so this balancing act kind of keeps us, you know, on the straight and narrow most of the time. Okay, so do we need God or government? We still need a little God and a little government, probably, because since our brains live in a sea of chemicals, we need these bright lines, the society places or some book places that says, look, if you're out here, you know, in here everything's fine, but once you get out here, you got to start worrying. Right? So as a society, I think what we've done is say, look, here's where the bright lines are. And of course, we move those occasionally. But here's where the lines are. Here's, you know, within this range, everything's pretty much appropriate. You can modulate your own behavior. Once you start getting outside those lines, then we as a group are going to say, we don't think that's acceptable. Okay? So I think we still need to have those bright lines, again, because we're not always consciously aware of these evolutionarily old impulses for good or bad behavior. Other factors that affect the release of oxytocin include developmental history. So in animals, animals that are abused or neglected don't develop oxytocin receptors, particularly in the forebrain, in which you get this good feeling when you behave in a positive social way. We found that about half of women who are repeatedly sexually abused as children don't release any oxytocin on stimulus. Um, we've also found within this 5% or so who don't respond in our experiments that a couple percent of those are, in fact, psychopaths. So psychopaths don't feel empathy, and they're mostly born that way. So you're born with bad genes. You just don't get this. You're just a, kind of a user. You, don't, you take advantage of people. They're kind of in per permanent survival mode. Um, and the psychopaths are not fixable. We've actually found in our blood test 
that we can identify them before they even behave in a certain way. So the oxytocin receptors seem to be dysfunctional. So there's no fix. We can't replace the oxytocin because the whole brain system that utilizes it doesn't work properly. So I avoid, I suggest avoiding the psychopaths. They are dangerous. Uh, so in writing this book, I really had to come to terms with why I spent 10 years of my life um, looking at moral behaviors. And in coming to terms with that, um, you know, the, the first answer was uh, I had done work, uh, some both an economist and a neuroscientist. And in my economist world, I had done work in the late 90s showing that countries that had high levels of interpersonal trust were more prosperous. So poor countries are by and large low trust countries. And when trust is low, very few transactions occur, including transactions that create wealth and reduce poverty. And so this work had a lot of impact. And the World Bank flies me out, you know, how do we raise trust in these developing countries? And what I couldn't answer was, for a given country, why two people who didn't know each other would ever trust each other. So that really led into our original trust experiments and then this longer odyssey. Um, but as I started writing the book, I really had to be honest about that. So, so for all this trust, trust is really important, relieving poverty. The true reason for this 10 years worth of work is uh, this woman right here, this nun, her name is Sister Mary Maristella. And this is a picture from, picture from the 1950s. Um, after the picture was taken, she decided to leave the Sisters of Loretto, the uh, order of nuns that she had joined and a couple years later became my mother. So you think you had an interesting childhood? Talk to me. Uh, so morality with a capital M was certainly in our house all the time. And I was an altar boy, I was raised Catholic, learned Latin, breathed in a lot of incense. And over time, it just didn't make sense to me that only Catholics go to heaven and you know, however good a Buddhist person you are or Hindi or whatever, uh, you're not the right kind of moral person. Um, so I think in rejecting that kind of view of this top-down morality that my mother had, um, I was looking for this underlying, like Adam Smith, terrestrial basis for moral behavior, a biological basis to understand good and evil. And this drove me to, um, to look at all these different experiments. As I said earlier, we've gone outside the lab as well to make sure that what we're finding in the laboratory works um, in real life. And I assiduously avoided anything having to do with religion because of my background. I didn't want to know, although we asked religious questions, you know, do you believe in God, do you pray? None of that affects behavior in the laboratory um, because oxytocin explains the vast majority of the variation in these behaviors. But anyway, having come to terms with my own weird religious background, um, we have now gone to churches, we've gone to folk dances, we've gone to uh, places where people congregate, where they exercise, uh, soldiers marching, and in all these circumstances, we found, indeed, that the majority of people will release oxytocin when they do these community activities. So again, I don't think these rituals are going away because uh, people who release oxytocin during these ecologically valid rituals feel closer to their community. And when you feel closer to your community, then you have the value of getting those, those social relationships. So um, I don't think churches are disappearing, but maybe in Europe, we'll see. Okay, so one more question really bugged me, which is all the studies I've shown you so far have been run either in Western Europe or the US. And I thought, well, if I'm really building a theory, a biological theory of morality, oxytocin release has got to be universal for this theory to be universal. Um, so last year, I went to the highlands of Papua New Guinea to run an experiment. So this is a rainforest in which there are 800 distinct languages because these tribes of subsistence farmers are very isolated and it can be very aggressive. 50 years ago, they were cannibals. Um, so I get there, and this is like the experiment from hell. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong, other than someone getting seriously hurt or killed. Um, no electricity, no running water. So we brought generators, we brought you know, all my own medical equipment. Um, but anyway, there were lots of issues that, that uh, made it a very difficult experiment to run. But we had these individuals do a typical ritual that they would engage in in their village and uh, let me show you what it looks like, and I'll tell you about it. Sono maku ga aku. This in Japanese. I can. Anyone here? Any Japanese speakers? So this is uh, good. So this is a uh, Japanese documentary on human evolution, and uh, so the camera crew uh, followed me for this experiment. And these are uh, people living in those called Maki. This is a traditional uh, war dance that they do. 
独特の装束をまとい闘争心を鼓舞します。この闘争心が人間にとっていかに根深いものなのかアメリカクレアモント大学教授のポール・ザック博士は体内のホルモンからその謎に迫っています。心身を踊る前と後でホルモンがどのように変化するか調べました。テストステロンというホルモンが平均で 15% 上昇していることが分かりました。テストステロンとは男性ホルモンの一つ、闘争のホルモンと呼ばれています。戦う気持ちにさせるこのホルモンは人間には誰にでも備わっています。その特徴は必要とあれば直ちに上昇するということです。So、Ripley I give them the luxury of releasing oxytocin and behaving in pro social ways. And so this feedback loop can start occurring. Of course, you can unwind this. You can do this backwards. We see lots of countries doing this. So if this feedback loop is real, we should be able to see data at the country level suggesting this is happening. And in fact, we do see that. So this is data on tolerance. It's a little hard to read, but there's a strong income gradient on measures of tolerance. Ability to tolerate people who are different than you. There's a nice income gradient for things like trust, and there's even income gradient for happiness. So, countries that are、uh, more tolerant, more trusting, are more prosperous and are happier. And in fact, we found the same thing at the level of individuals in a recent experiment in which we looked at the differences in oxytocin release. We asked, what's different about people who release lots of oxytocin when they're trusted versus those who release little? And the people who released the most were, in fact, happier in their lives. And they were happier because they had better relationships of all types better romantic relationships, more close friends, closer to family. They're even nicer to strangers in our laboratory task. So、um, we've looked at many ways to release oxytocin. And one of those is touch. In our early, one of our early experiments, we showed that touch induces oxytocin release. And so you, know, you have to believe your own research. And so I started changing my life because of my own research. And one of the things I do is I refuse the handshake now. I hug everybody. And so the students in my lab started calling me Dr. Love as a, as a kind of a joke. And、uh, anyway, I had this reporter a couple years ago from Past Company Magazine come to the lab, ran through some experiments, and then he outed me as Dr. Love in the title of his、uh, article about me. And at first I was a little bit unhappy because I'm a serious scientist, right? And I started thinking, like, What better thing can I do in the world than to encourage people to connect more, to show more love? In fact, oxytocin is just like love. You can't force someone to love you, and you can't force your own brain to release oxytocin. You can only give it to somebody else. And if you give it to somebody else, again, for 95% of those people, they're likely to reciprocate and show you that love, that care, that empathy in return. And so I think, yeah, if I'm Dr. Love, fine. If I can encourage people to be more connecting, more loving, I think I've done something good in the world. Um, so, anyway, the book has a lot of practical ways that you can do that besides just hugging people. And I think what it means is that we can take charge of our social lives and build communities 
that allow us to foster better social relationships and more happiness. So understanding how to harness the power of oxytocin, I think, is potentially very valuable. By the way, I should say, since I'm at Google, we've also shown in a number of experiments that using social media, like Google+, induces a release of oxytocin as well. So connection is what we need. Connection is what we want. And if you understand that that's a deep part of our evolutionary history, a deep part of our human nature, then I think it frees you up to connect to others and to um, enjoy the reduction in stress, the improvement in the immune system, and the increase in happiness that you get from oxytocin release. So, uh, okay, I've said a lot. How about if I take some questions and um, we can hang on and chat a little bit? Oh, there's no questions at all. Yeah, Michael, we should let him go first because I picked on him. He's a fine person, we know that. So, I have a question. Um, does the ability to perceive uh, oxytocin changes over time in the same person? So That's a great question. And so um, there is evidence suggesting that the more you release oxytocin, the more you lower the threshold for release. In other words, it gets easier to release oxytocin. So by the way, that's different than fear. So fear we acclimate to. So I can scare you, and then you get used to that stimulus. I have to try to keep increasing it. For oxytocin release, it makes it gets easier and easier, which is very interesting. So even though there's some experimental evidence to, to suggest that, my own experience is the same. So I'm an introvert, and I kind of get tired talking to people. But it turned out that the more I connect to people, the easier it gets, and presumably the more oxytocin I'm releasing. So I'm subject number one in that experiment. Yeah, thanks. So did I understand correctly that um, you you said you could test establish where people were on the psychopath scale through blood testing? Uh, we have, yeah, we have evidence that we can identify the psychopaths. Uh, we can't nail down exactly where they are on the scale, but if you're um, severe enough, this is the hair psychopathology checklist. Um, if you're severe enough on the checklist, you'll get picked up on our blood test. Yeah. So are, are you concerned with the sort of criminal justice applications of this at some point in the future? Right. So I see people who I talk to, groups I talk to who really like this work a lot are lawyers and judges because they have these frequent flyers. Um, so I've spent a fair time, amount of time in uh, courthouses and jails interviewing these individuals to find out why they don't respond to punishments. Um, and there's some actually very funny stories in there and some also some tragic stories. Um, but I'm not worried about a kind of brave new world approach where, again, we're you know, shooting this stuff into people's brains because, number one, the effects are fairly subtle, and number two, um, the psychopaths don't seem to have the receptors for oxytocin, so even if I replace it. Now, having said that, there are drugs in development that can increase the number of oxytocin receptors, and so those might be used to treat a variety of disorders associated with improper social behavior, schizophrenia, depression, social anxiety, and maybe psychopathology. So, again, I think society needs to say where that line lies. I need to do the basic research and show the world what we can do with it. So, I mean, given that the hair test is used to, to sort of approve or deny parole in some states, I mean, would, do you think that would be a, a useful thing if, if this blood test became um, used eventually to, to sort of decide people's futures? Right. So I think, you know, we're still doing more research on this, so I'd say you know, the jury is still out. Um, there's a funny story I tell in the book about uh, being pulled into a murder case. So there was a, a, a internet op entrepreneur in the Silicon Valley named Hans Reiser who was uh, getting divorced. His wife was Russian. And instead of divorcing his wife, he decides instead to kill her. And um, he's on trial for this. They never find the body. The last day of the trial, he's going to be convicted for sure. He pleads to, uh, to first-degree murder to avoid the death penalty. And, and shows the prosecutor where the body is. Uh, he goes to jail for life. He's in San Quentin. A year in San, into San Quentin, he writes a four-page handwritten appeal to the state of California, asking for a new trial, citing my research, claiming that his lawyer had oxytocin deficit disorder, this disorder I've called, which you don't release oxytocin. And, of course, that appeal was denied. But, I mean, the lack of insight. Right? Here's a guy who has no empathy at all, who's claiming his lawyer didn't have empathy and couldn't represent him properly. So, so it's getting into the law now. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're uh, the, the largest group of neuroscientists have come out in the last couple of years saying that many of the new neuroscience findings, like brain imaging, 
are not ready for the courtroom because they are um, they can induce more bias than they can remove uncertainty in in people's minds. So they are more prejudicial than they are probative. Yeah, great question. Thanks. Yeah. Two, two related questions on the um, assuming that there are other um, factors, say besides trust that might affect a country's prosperity. Whether could you name a few countries who, who may, may have had um, high, uh, low trust but high prosperity? And then on the individual level, is it possible again similarly to the five percent of people who were kind of um, psychopathic? Is it possible to override the um, oxytocin uh, pathway process and still do some of these negative things but have fully functioning oxytocin receptors? Great question. Two great questions. So we actually ran a horse race using cross-country data to ask, does oxytocin, which facilitates trust, does that come first or do you need kind of good institutions? And so it's the institutions that actually uh, generate high trust and the oxytocin response to that. So those are um, a government that fairly enforces contracts, independent judiciary, um, having a well-functioning social sector, so not a lot of social strife, and having a well-functioning economic sector. So for example, very high variance in distribution of income tends to drag down trust levels because now it's harder to understand if someone's going to behave nicely because they might be under survival stress. And so yeah, so fixing those three sectors come first, and then the brain responds and this feeling of safety. So a great example is London or New York, which you know, 25, 30 years ago were much less safe places, and have become actually much friendlier, much uh, safer, and actually very prosperous. Uh, so I was in New York um, 10 days ago. I mean, two in the morning, you can walk around, you feel totally comfortable in Manhattan. I'm mean, just about anywhere. So, um, so yeah, there, there are again, there's this positive feedback loop. The second question was on individuals who don't seem to have these oxytocin receptors. So again, a short story to illustrate this point. Um, we ran a uh, uh, experiment for a TV show, uh, which I talk about in the book, a show on the seven deadly sins. And so of course I was hoping to get lust. Unfortunately, I got greed. I thought I could do lust. But anyway, uh, the, the shtick on the show was they took a woman from the Donald Trump show, The Apprentice in the US, and who was gorgeous, successful, but famously greedy. And we ran it through a battery of trials to understand, is she a psychopath? Is she using people? Or, And so she was very, actually very greedy for money. In fact, we put her on intranasal oxytocin, didn't affect her behavior. Um, so she has many of the attributes of psychopaths, although she has a very funny developmental history, um, which you can read about in the book. Her father was a drug dealer, although she's very intelligent. Um, but when we did other tasks with her, like we did some cooperation tasks, in which uh, they don't involve money. She was wonderfully cooperative and actually a very nice person, but she doesn't have the underlying oxytocin release. So she can still be a nice person when she wants to, but you know when it comes to business, she will take your face off if she can. Right? So again, we learn to modulate this. And so again, it's not just oxytocin. There's lots of other factors that affect our, our social behaviors, but that was really the missing mechanism that motivates the, many of the positive behaviors. Yeah, thanks. Um, so a lot of the behaviors you're talking about, oxytocin in the brain, but you're measuring it from blood like before and after samples. So I was just wondering if you could talk about the difference between the oxytocin in the brain versus in the blood. And are there any sort of experimental techniques coming up where you'll be able to more directly measure um, sort of during an activity rather than just a before and after snapshot? Right, great, um, great neuroscience question. So. Um, because oxytocin is so evolutionarily old, it's one of the few brain chemicals that's released simultaneously both in brain and blood under physiologic stress. So when we give these tasks, we're stressing you, and so what's in brain and blood actually are correlated. Baseline levels are not correlated, but under, under physiologic stress they are. So what's in blood is a, is a decent reflection of what's in brain, and we've uh, you know, collaborated, we've, we've confirmed what we see in blood by getting infusing intranasal oxytocin. So we show the brain releases oxytocin for this task, then we infuse oxytocin and show we can replicate the task. And we've done things like functional brain imaging to show in these tasks we see a, a big activation or a larger activation versus controls in areas that are rich in oxytocin receptors. 
Um, so we are working now on, uh, actually with the U.S. military, on very rapid ways to measure oxytocin release. So I can't talk about those, but there are um, ways we're investigating that may um, allow us to measure on a second-by-second -second basis or even faster um, what is going on in the brain. Um, you seem to be saying that uh, the cause and effect from increased oxytocin to sort of increased empathy or increased trust uh, works in both directions. Is that is that correct? Is that what what you are saying? Right. So it's the receipt of a positive social signal. It could be a signal of trust. Could be a hug that induces the recipient's brain to release oxytocin and then motivates these moral behaviors or pro-social behaviors. But you also were saying that if you inject or, or nasally inject oxytocin equivalents, then you can see changes in behavior. Right. So the reason for the oxytocin inhaler studies is to, again, complete that circle, but also because it gives someone, gives people in the experiment a physiologically equivalent social signal. So, so I could in experiments go and have everyone hug each other, but those, that would have varying effects across individuals. When I give you the oxytocin spray, it's as if you've received a positive social signal and everyone gets the same signal. Yeah, another good question. One more question and then we'll sign some books. No more questions. Okay, so thanks to you guys for coming. And uh, if you want to chat afterwards, come by and get a hug from me. I'm Dr. Love. And uh, thanks so much for your questions. Thank you.